Hello, I'm Catherine McBean from the People's Food and Farming Alliance. And today I'm at Homemakers with Charles Dowding and friends. We're gonna be uncovering the realities of geoengineering, what it is and what we can do to mitigate the impacts, particularly in the areas where we're growing food or rearing livestock. It's a great privilege to be here with a brilliant scientist who's working on Tesla-based science and looking at how that can help humanity now in a different way to how so much of what we've been calling science works. And I'm in particularly interested because of how it can help uh, mitigate impacts from uh, pollution, from um, weather events and improve soil quality. Uh, so yeah, what do you reckon to that? <laughs> well, um, it's all about the water as well because water has memory. Um, water's critical to all life. What's interesting is life can't exist. There's not a single form of life that can exist without water. So water, that tells us water's absolutely critical. So you've been working to improve water quality? Yes. Primarily? And yeah. that relates to clouds? Uh, yes, that's, um, clouds is a fascinating subject. A cloud is a, a potential for rain in the ethers. That might not mean a lot to people, <laughs> yeah. but... Um, Perhaps that, you that's could where water comes from. Briefly explain the ether, because that's something we don't hear much about, is it? Yeah, um, ether is known as chi, organ. Nikola Tesla said, if you don't understand how the ether works, you won't really understand anything. And that was the key to him inventing things. Uh, when we say ether, we're talking of the energy that's behind the whole of the universe, really. But it's um, not energy that modern science can measure, is that the point? No, when I went to CERN, they said that ether doesn't exist. And I explained CERN it. in Switzerland, where they're yes. doing particle accelerator. Yes, yeah, the Hadron Collider. One of their chief scientists, I had 30 people standing around me listening to a conversation. And in the end, he had to admit, um, for example, when a solar flare happens, how come within a second Earth's magnetic field reacts? That's before the light gets So in. that's faster than the speed of light. Absolutely. So the ether doesn't follow the normal So he couldn't rules, explain that. And it's uh, every time the solar flare happens, we know that this magnetic field expands. So there's got to be another connection there, but surely scientifically. You, you can't see a solar flare until it's got here, so that has travelled by the speed of light. How does Correct. that work? Correct. So the Earth's magnetic field starts to change first, and then we see the solar flare later. But they do have satellites oh, out there that pick right. it up as well. Okay, so the magnetism tells so you the that the solar flare is going to come. This yeah. is outrageous. Okay, so, so the ether is all around us. It, it kind of holds everything in place. How would you describe it? What's it doing? Um, it's to do with life energy force as well. Hmm. Um, Even how plants grow? In, in yeah, markets? absolutely. <laughs> plants need certain specific frequencies as well. Um, we'll look at some information in the sciences later on. For example, how vortices and vortexes affect how plants work. You know, if you look at the sun. You mean the pattern of growth is, is some yeah. kind of spiral? Yeah. Um, if you look on the face of a sunflower, there's two vortices. vortices. Two vortices? Yeah, a clockwise and anti-clockwise. So this comes back to DNA and the spiral, the, the, the yeah, torus life, spiral? life energy. Um, mm. Thomas Joseph Brown worked out that even the position of the planets change how plants react. Wow. It's very, and that's accurate. He spent years doing that and proved it's absolutely true. So I'm now going to broach a slightly different subject, but which relates to it, and that is what we call geoengineering. Yes. How is that affecting plant growth? Um, geoengineering does exist. I've got about 15 books on it. I've sat at Oxford University um, and uh, the other university in Oxford and um, what's the other university? Cambridge. Cambridge I University. Was at Cambridge. Yeah. yeah. Um, they have uh, uh, meetings and conferences on exactly uh, how they do it. Could one also call it weather modification? Is this yeah, solar same radiation same? management, geoengineering. Right, and it's been going on since World War II, mainly, would you say? Um, they've done tests, the military used silver iodide. Right, that dramatically. in World War II, or before even. Yes, they made it rain and, um, yeah. through World War II, so they couldn't even move tanks and cannons and that sort of thing. Oh, um, okay. I've got a book where they did an experiment. They sprayed half a gram of silver iodide and it created a cloud 12 cubic miles, rain on one side and snow on the other. That's in their science book as a fact, an experiment they did. Okay, and now we're also seeing linked to that some particulates being dispersed aerosols in the stratosphere? Well, originally they were using aluminium sulfates, but that causes precipitation. 
so it was dropping too soon and three or four days later it's all dropped and they've got to keep spraying it. Now they've moved on to electromagnetic uh, particulates known as graphene or graphene oxide and called hydrogel. Seven and a half times lighter than air, stays up for months. Oh. Um, it's transparent as a nanoparticulate. It's now in the water and we're drinking it. Oh. And I can prove it with a microscope. Yeah. Okay. Um, um, so, and no wonder it's uh, now used in vaccines. Okay. So that causes problems for blood clotting. We're getting we into know. quite deep stuff here, yeah. Yeah. But it's basically what, what's behind, so the, 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 the graphene is being used again as a rain stimulant? Or, or what? Uh, yes, it's uh, to manipulate the electrical conductivity of the atmosphere, and that's how weather works, doesn't it? It's electromagnetic. So, but how, how can they actually control whoever they are? Who is they? Who's doing all this? Do we know? Um, it started with the military, and they actually have ionizers on the surface of the Earth, um, positive ion generators. Even a cell phone tower is a positive ion cell generator. Positive ions are bad for our health. Is that right? Absolutely. Right. See, years ago, we used to ground on the earth. We, did, we weren't an electric soup. We're in now a billion times more electric soup than we were 100 years ago. A billion. Mm, okay. If you could see it with your eyes, you would be absolutely shocked. So actually, it's pretty incredible. Many of us are more or less healthy. Yeah. Here's, here's the kicker, though, because positive ions travel through your body. And when, for every positive ion that goes through your body, you lose a negative ion. Those are very difficult to replace because there's always an, a positive gain of positive ions. Cell phone towers, Wi-Fi, mobile phones. So, so it's, ripping, <laughs> it's ripping negative ions out of us. Okay. Um, what that does, that changes the pH of the body oh, and okay. it induces it's a cancerous atmosphere. So now we've got young children uh -huh. with brain tumours. Never heard of before. No. Very common because mm. they're on the mobile phone uh, the pH changes. So it the rips. phone also is positive ions? Yes, oh. microwaves. Two point, isn't it unusual? 2.4 gigahertz. It's your microwave. Look on the back of a microwave, 2.4 gigahertz. Radiation. What's the significance of that? Radiation. It's basically radiation? Well, yes. like an x-ray, that kind of thing? Right? Yes. Right, okay. Um, uh, so what's the solution? We... The solution is, um, I've developed some products. One is you can put hundreds of millions of negative ions in drinking water, for example. And when you drink it, I do a, a microscopic experiment on people's blood. I show them the clots. Three or four minutes later, there's no blood clots mm -hmm. because negative ions discharge through the body almost instantly. But you need some actual source of negative ions. You can't. What about being yes. in nature? People say absolutely. Take your shoes and socks off. Mm -hmm. All them positive ions discharge through your feet and go back to earth. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Well, that's powerful and, and somebody could do that today. Yeah. They can come out here and walk on the grass. And I assure you, you will, have not, you will not have blood clots. Mm, okay. They call it Rouleau. And what happens is the blood platelets and the haemoglobin, they are like flat pancakes. Right. And they all stick together face to face because if they lose the electrical charge, they don't repel each other. They all start sticking to each other magnetically. That's not what you want. If so that's the clot developing. Yes. So if you employed five or six workers and you trained them all together so they couldn't move, that's what you're doing to your blood. They all stick together and they lose the surface area, which so, so means they can't discharge oxygen and they cannot collect carbon dioxide. That's quite important. What, for our blood, in our yeah. bodies? Yeah, because they're all stuck together. Why do so, we need to collect carbon dioxide in the body? Well, you create carbon dioxide and you need to discharge it from your body, surely. Oh, I see part of the discharge through your lungs. Yes, Breathing. well, that goes through the blood. Okay, yeah. That's how it's <laughs> transported. <laughs> It's and it exits yeah. the body, yeah. Right. So the blood, the blood is the most critical part of the body. It's the connection between every cell of the body. It delivers hormones, vitamins, minerals, proteins. Right. Hydrates the body. And it's very closely linked to water. So drinking good yeah, water is, is, is so water. key, therefore. Yeah. Structuring. You talk about structured water. What well, does I was mean? just going to come on to that. So water is critical to life. The condition of the water is also very critical. And there's an amazing thing that we found out that once water's gone through a torus vortex, the condition and it's restructured the water, mm. that's what it loves. And you think if you put bottled water on a shelf for up to two years, mm. it's dead. Mm. If you drink it, it's bad for you. I, I found my own experience drinking water like that, I, it doesn't quench my thirst. My no. throat stays dry. No. And then um, I've got for other devices, but you, you're talking about hot, 
the torus vortex. I mean, how could a, an ordinary person get hold of a torus vortex? Is it possible? Um, uh, quite simply, even a brook or a river, you see, you see vortices uh -huh. spinning round in circles. So if you could get spring water from a, a bubbling yeah. brook, that's yeah. the best. Earth water, brilliant. But you've got or, a device that can make it. Yes, and the, the interesting thing is you can accelerate the condition of the water by putting it through a magnetic field. And things like um, the pyramid shape at 52 degrees with shungite and magnetite in a magnetic field enhances the condition of the water. So you can take this a long way, can't you? But just coming back to the magnet, I really like the sound of that because I've got a magnet on my hose here. And since using it, I've noticed two things. One, uh, well, in the house, it doesn't scale up the kettle. Anymore, yes. We're in hard water. And the other one is, like, we've noticed in the polytunnel, the growth of plants is much stronger. Yes. Structured water is therefore better for plants? Um, absolutely. Um, you could put a vortex in the line of a hose pipe, so it structures the water with magnets on it, and all the water coming from the hose pipe yeah. for the plants is now structured. But the magnet would be creating a vortex if you get the right kind of magnet on your hose. Um, <laughs> Do you reckon? It's, well, the, the magnetic field does enhance yeah. it. The, the critical part is the vortex. It actually generates an electrical field as well. So, the, yeah, and that would be what negatively charged? Is that the idea? Um, negative it ions? conditions the water. Um, yes, magnets and copper uh, generate a positive charge. Uh, okay, That's what an alternator is. Basically, oh, yeah, okay. it's, it's copper moving in magnets or magnets moving around copper. It's making electricity. Yeah. So you brought along today some devices which you help to restore the atmosphere to its natural state? Uh, yes, <laughs> there's no energy in the capacitor itself. It's a tube with right. some special equipment in. Um, contains an array of mirrors and some organic and uh, metallic materials. Um, what it does, it connects the charge of the earth to the atmosphere, a bit like putting a copper wire over two electric contacts. It allows the two to connect to each other. Why are they not connecting otherwise? Um, good question. A um, number of reasons for that. One is partly deliberate, what's in the atmosphere, pollutants. Ah. Um, but when you're looking at the ether's life energy force, that works in a totally different way. But is the ether being disabled in some way that it can't help the Earth's energy get into the atmosphere then? Um, you're getting into a deeper subject here, but people call it karma. If, oh, you, ge <laughs> if you generate a bad atmosphere in a certain place, um, there's been some terrible atrocities, murders, children tortured and killed. Um, they're finding that the plants and the growth and the energy in that place becomes very negative wow. and you get drought. Could your capacitor heal that bad energy then, for yes. example, Yeah. then they need to be deployed. <laughs> yes. This is um, fantastic to That's hear. what this is about. Yeah. But the unusual thing is something, something happens to people that use cannons and translators, and if ever you have one here regularly, you will find that the plants grow prolific. There's a wow. massive change in the energy of the growth. Oh, this is exciting. And one hear. of the complaints I have is that they can't cut the grass quick enough. <laughs> but when you say, <laughs> how, how long might a capacitor or translator need to be here? Say so just here, for example. Um, you'd see changes in two to three weeks. Okay, so it just be in situ. It's not powered up in any way. It's just nope. mirrors and, as you say, bits um, of stone. And it's a little bit like a battery. If you leave a light on on the battery and it goes flatter and flatter and flatter, yeah. you have to switch it off. And quite often, the battery starts to resurrect itself. And when you switch it on, the light bulb comes back on. So what you can't do, you can't leave it on permanently. When you the say on though, it's not on, or what does... Well, if you left it discharged, so the caps are off and it's constantly running. Ah, so putting the caps on so is enough... So it equalises kind of the it two energy and there's no potential left. Oh, and that's okay. rule number one that yeah. Tesla said, you must have two opposing potentials to get a reaction. For anything to happen. Yeah, positive, negative. But what the capacitor is doing is, is equalising the potentials and then it starts working, basically. Yes, it is. It makes the oh, connection. Okay. That's in its simplest form. Yeah. It's far complex than that. Okay. But in <laughs> essence, that's what it does. Well, I feel you're really helping me to understand it more. I mean, I, you know, I went to university, I've, I've had all the classical education, but I've never learned anything like this. And it's so fascinating because it yeah. makes, actually makes more sense in terms of growing plants and yeah. weather and uh, everything. Yeah, and if you look at planting, well, I put the seed in and it grows and I take it out. It's not yeah. a clinical operation. Yeah. There's far more it's to it. It's never really that. been explained, has it? Well, I don't feel it has in what I learned <clears> about how plants grow. How do, how do plants get hold of food in the soil, for example? I mean, you must have studied that. Um, <clears throat> this was bombshell to me because I was listening to Radio 4 
and there was a soil, I don't know what you call a soil expert, I don't know, it's horticulturist or whatever it is, but he says, we have stomachs. You go to McDonald's or wherever you go, you eat food, your stomach processes it, takes all the goodness out, gets rid of the waste and uses what's left. Well, plants don't have stomachs. They haven't got one. So how do they make their food? They have to have food. So the stomach and the plant is actually the soil and the bacteria, it's the types of bacteria in the soil. And this is the magic thing about it. The soil gives the plant its nourishment and the plant gives back a little gift in the form of, um, it's like uh, different chemicals and liquids. And the bacteria says, thank you very much, Trans- transmits and starts processing that, converts it into food to the plant again and sends it back up again. But so there's a lovely oh, marriage so, made in the soil. <laughs> this totally links to, to what you know, scientists are now finding out about how plants actually yeah. grow. But wh- how did you work that out? Or, you know, is this through well, it was on Radio 4 and then I carried on investigating it and sure enough, you know, all the you, different the uh, proteins and the processes yeah. in winter and summer and how the plants work. Yeah. Um, ironically, I mean, the vegetation dies and rots. The bacteria then uses that, converts mm-hmm. it, and passes yeah. it back to the plant as food. Because what's now Amazing. coming out also is that you know synthetic fertilizers that people have been thinking are so great uh, actually depress soil life and even kill it off, and then the plants become dependent yeah. on them, don't they? Because so the bacteria is not there anymore. No, exactly. So if you can kill the bacteria, you've got a nice business every year because <laughs> exactly. they need fertilizers. Yeah, I think we're just coming through that. Thank goodness. You know, there's so much more evidence now in the gardening and farming world in favour of the more biological approach that you've just described. And that's, yeah. that's what sits with my work. It's a shame it comes down to profiteering. Yeah, so much though, doesn't it? Mm. But, you know, rather than focus on that, we, what I'd lo- I'm happy to, to see you here. I'm seeing a big blue hole in the sky above homemakers. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> like, I love cool. what the shredded clouds are not particularly good. What you want is the nice clean cut edges. You know, when we were young children, we used to see them cotton wool clouds with big blue, yeah. dark cobalt blue. Right, in the sky. compared That's to now, it's all much more sort of phased out, isn't it? Yeah. Edges, not... And, and also um, the blue, I'm finding the blue is not as dark blue as it used to be. It's more creamy white, even sometimes. Yeah, um, it is true. I'm not talking conspiracy theories here. Um, there is an operation going on where we call it uh, geoengineering because they're saying we need climate. We've got global warming, climate change. We need to do something they've officially said they want to do solar radiation management, yeah. spraying so, chemicals in the atmosphere. Yeah. And graphene is, is though, one we, of them. We haven't got climate change, have we? We've got weather yeah. changing like it does. The climate changes on its own. Yeah, exactly. And you know one yeah. thing they never ever mention, yeah. which is insanity, what changes 96% of the climate? Uh, I don't know. The what? sun. Oh, okay. The sun, it has, it's, got, it's got an 11-year cycle, for starters, yeah. where you get no solar flares. Mm-hmm. That changes the climate massively, but nobody ever mentions it. Well, surely they are, though. They, that's what this solar radiation management, which really frightens me, is about, isn't it? Controlling the amount of sun reaching the what earth. They, yeah, that's what they're saying. If we block out the sun, mm. it's going to be good for us. Well, it's not going to be good for the plants, is it? This is insane. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's not good for us either, is it? And, no. You know, our health and well-being. But the sad thing about graphene is um, it uh, discharges negative ions as well in the body. And that's not good for the body. The Where do they go? Um, if it discharges them, they leave the body in some way. Well, when you get a positive ion, hit a negative ion, they cancel each other out. That's the problem. So you basically lose your negative charge. We're in a positive ion soup mm. and the negative ion's lost. So going back to your devices, your capacitors, they can reduce the amount of graphene that's around? Um, you're going, I'd advise your listeners to listen to what Willem Reich did years ago. Right. He found some amazing discoveries. He was a scientist. Um, he was also a psychologist. And yeah. he, he understood how this system worked. I, I couldn't agree more. I've been reading up about Wilhelm Reich and it's been a revelation and his yeah. work was totally suppressed, wasn't it? But it's brilliant yes. way of looking at the world in a really positive way, energy and understanding more. Yeah. He first discovered this by you said you got a boathouse and they were building with scaffolding pipes. And the scaffolding pipes were by the side of the lake in Organon, where he lived. And he accidentally trod on one of these pipes and it lifted up out the water. The water ran down it and when he got off it it ran back down again. And when he looked across the lake he saw this wave go whoosh and like a plasma wave went shot straight across the lake. And he thought, did I actually see that? 
So we trod on it again and another wave went across and he thought the water and the tube reacting with water passing through it on the surface of the water he could see the scientific reaction to it. There was an energy there he didn't never seen before. What would you and call that energy he, now? Does that have a name? Um, it's an etheric flow. Right, so okay. it was a change in potential of water running through the tube and not running through it. So what is very sensitive to the ether in some way? Um, <laughs> it's a reaction it. between water and metallic surfaces. That's what it was. Oh, okay, right. And he saw it affected it. If you cause a disturbance in that energy, right. it gave a wave off and he witnessed that. And that's what gave birth to his cloud buster. Brilliant. Yeah. I Kate Bush sang about that, didn't she? She wrote, she wrote a song and sang yeah. it about cloud busting. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I didn't realise. I think a lot of us listened to that song without quite realising. Yeah. Because it was all about Wilhelm Reich. It was based on his son, wasn't it? Yeah. Okay. Well, but it's all in the sciences. Yeah. This is the amazing thing. It's not about theories, and it's on about getting yeah. back to basic science. Cool. And that's, it's that's provable. I think that's a great note. We'll we'll wind up here. But thank you so much for all of your insights, and I hope that you listeners uh, I get as much from this as I get it because it's just it's, it's mind-blowing in a really positive way blow away the cobwebs and we can see things a bit differently and understand more truly understand and how we can make the world a better place thank you thank you so thanks for joining us today um, we'd be really really helpful if you could get us in front of any farmers growers horticulturalists anyone who needs to understand why the net zero argument is not valid and what is actually causing the changes within our climate.